Welcome to another episode of the Impossible Life Podcast. I'm your co-host, Nick Surface, and I'm sat across from a man who was thrown off his native planet of Fragonia as a baby for burning down three houses with his acidic vomit. That's right, friends, the former Navy SEAL. <laughs> Garrett Unklebach, a man known as Dragon Breath in his homeland. What is Fragonia? Okay. You're, you're going to have to explain uh, this one, look, I think. There's a lot that goes into this one. First of all, Fragonia is the fictional planet that I made up for where you're actually from, because there's no way you're from Earth. Uh, <laughs> because I couldn't... I had to, Okay, so where this comes from... That's true. Oh, there you go. <laughs> this is random. Your mom's awesome, right? I yes, like, she is. She's great. And I had the pleasure of spending time with all the Uncle Box at once, which I don't think I've ever had before, and I had this privilege. And as such... I think your mom secretly loves my intros because she was feeding me all sorts of information. <laughs> and you, as a kid, uh, ruined more than a my few mom, carpets. My mom loves that you love me. Does she really? Yes. Well, that's sweet of her. I don't really know what to say to that, man. That's totally disarming. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, I really don't know what to say. But the point is is that she was telling me about how you ruined carpets because you, would just, you were a ralpher, as, as she called it. <laughs> so, I spit fire, dude. Yeah. Since there you day go. one. Day one, fire breath. Anyways... G you know, you know, this episode is actually a first. What's that? Oh, right. <laughs> do you do you really want to bring that up, man? I now you, you just did, so now we have to. Yeah. This, this is, is a this is a first. This is a first. We it's have actually a second. Uh, it's a second. Yeah. What? Okay. <laughs> do you want to tell them? Jesus? No, you go ahead. Well, so I, you know, Garrett is the talent. I was really actually saying that to your credit because we've been going for almost two years. Yeah. And this is the first time we've had to do this. So yeah, we've had this is the second take of this episode because the first one. Was unfortunately there was a, an error with the computer recording, and so it sounded like we were on vinyl, and everything was like repeating again. So we got we got to practice what we learned in our troubleshooting podcast. We did, and it was mostly a very aggressive text towards Garrett about what happened, and so you know we got to there, and uh, you know it's not going to happen again. <laughs> we we found a good backup source to make sure it never happens again. So there you go, friends. We are not immune to mistakes and glitches and errors, just like anyone else. But we overcame. So, anyways. Gee, as people are listening to this, I'm sure they're amused by uh, us doing take two. But what's not take two? When this comes out, there will be 11 days until we start Mindset right. Mastery, which we are very the, excited about. The closer about. we get, I'm more excited about Same. Mindset Mastery. Yes. If, you, if you've been online and you've looked on our website, you will see that there's actually the members portal area that you can snoop around in without signing if up. You, if you haven't been there yet, go to our website, theimpossible.life. Yeah, and you can look it up. And you can see where the members portal is going to be. It's where you're going to access the live calls. It's where you're going to access your self-assessment. It's where you're going to get your personalized training plan as well as your personalized application for each topic. I can tell topic. you we're, we're doing something that's it's, it's in the realm of space where people have, they're like, oh, well, I've seen this before. You haven't seen anything like this before. Correct. You've seen online masterminds, online group coachings, things like that. But where this is very different is not just in the training, but in everything that we're doing after that. We have some personalized quizzes and questions for you to really, for you to understand where am I at on this topic. Then we have uh, personalized training to you based upon your quiz. Okay, this is how I like learn and grow from yes. this topic better. Uh, but this isn't just like a college course and we don't just want you to learn. If it was a college course, it'd be a nice one. You're going to be with a bunch of other people yeah. who want the same things as you, who are very focused on their growth. You're going to be learning some great topics. But more than a college course, it's going to give you the part that college doesn't give you, which is how to apply this to your life. Yeah. So this is for people who have a strong growth agenda, a strong learning agenda, who want to be their best and want to be around other people who want to be their best. And these, what we've identified is 12 topics. We cover one topic a month over a year to really like when we started this, Nick asked me like, how would you give your mindset to somebody? Right. And That's right. Exactly so we've, right. we've focused that in on these 12 topics over a year that I can share the mindset that, that, that God has given me that I've developed uh, with other people. Yeah. And that's, that is very well said G. What I can say is, I mean, I have to give you honor. Garrett's going to be our instructor on this. I'm going to be there to help uh, wherever I can and help I'll almost be like proctoring. But I always say I'm the first listener and I have to give you honor because since we've been doing this podcast for nearly two years, like we referenced earlier, my life is just like the hockey stick has just gone straight up as far as the pro uh, pro progression curve goes. It's like I've been on rocket fuel and it's been a lot from all the research. I mean, we've gotten together every week for the past two years and studied a topic together, yeah. put all our thoughts down and then put it into a format that we can deliver a podcast to you that's entertaining. Now, imagine if you did that with your friend who was a Navy SEAL who had an elite mindset and loved Jesus. Well, that's the opportunity we're giving you is to now come and do what and, I've done. And not only have I, I, I will tell you this too, like, you know, when I tell people about you or when I tell the story of, of our podcast and things like that, that really God sent you into my life. 
And just as much as you feel like I've been a gift to you, you've been a gift to me. Um, we've grown closer together, just like people will in this program. But yes. also, you know, Nick being in my life in this way has helped me develop myself and helped, yeah. helped me develop some of this content that was within me. And he's helped drawn it out of me, helps me get it into the podcast mm-hmm. and the way that we do, because I couldn't do this by myself or it wouldn't be near as good if I did it by myself. So I say that to say as a great example of uh, one of the things for Mindset Mastery is we've uh, highly incentivized the pricing yes. that you will do it with someone else. Yes, please do it, man. Go find somebody and say, let's get a line on this. Let's grow fast together. If, you if will you're not doing it. it with another person, it's less than $100 a month. Yeah, which, I mean, do it. If you buy a Starbucks every day, you're spending more <laughs> than that, kid. You make all the uh, the Starbucks and guacamole jokes here. Guacamole? Yeah, people you know, say like if you, you know, Guacamole is like two bucks at Chipotle or whatever it is. Dude, I think they've downed the price. Remember when they, anyways, I was about, I just ate Chipotle <laughs> today. So I was about to reference that. Let's not get too distracted. Garrett, what are we talking to people well, about uh, today? Uh, last thing I'll, okay. I'll just say is that the mindset mastery, it's all these uh, topics that we've covered on the podcast, but it's just covering them in a deeper way. You're going to continue to grow and Nick and I are going to continue yes. to grow uh, just by doing the podcast, just by listening to the podcast. But I know there's some of you out there that even when you listen to the podcast, you take notes, mm-hmm. you share it with other people. You're saying, how can I grow and be better? For some of you, this is the right choice yes. to join us in mindset mastery and take your growth to the next level. Could not agree more. Now, speaking of next level, Everyone knows that Garrett's a former Navy SEAL, and today's topic is one that the Navy SEALs have been studied by Harvard Business Review. You can Google this and find no shortage of research and different companies that have written about this teamwork, right? Navy SEALs are known for their elite teamwork. Absolutely. And so we're going to dive into that with Garrett. He's got a very well thought out. It really is the thing. Like if you want to look at like what is the greatness around the SEAL teams, Yeah. It is the team's part, mm. right? You take a Navy SEAL by himself, and yes, he's been trained well, but what makes a Navy SEAL very special is when you put him with another Navy SEAL, Yeah, right? I can train, I can be with, you know, SEALs that aren't from my generation. They're from the East Coast, right? Guys I didn't work with or know, but we can come together in a short amount of time. Like, I, because of the things that we've been through together, because of the training that we've been through, we have so much ability to work together, right? And so the power of the SEAL teams is, and it's be, it's because of the, the culture that we came through, what we learned about leadership and teamwork, your ability to rely on another person. That What's special about the SEAL teams is not that it's, you know, very talented people or very smart people or very hardworking, very dedicated people. It's their ability to work together. Um, so we're going to dive into teamwork a little bit today. That's what this episode's about. And there'll be some false conceptions about uh, Navy SEAL teams that I do want to talk about because sure. you obviously know what it's like on there. But when people think of teamwork, I think they think of great teams and where we see teams really highlighted yeah, for sure. is in sports. And when I think of teams and great teams, gee, I think of the 1992 USA basketball dream oh, team. Oh, yeah, Man. the dream team. Oh, dude, I mean, listen to this. Charles Barkley, Larry Bird, Clyde Drexler, Patrick Ewing, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Carl Malone, Scottie Pippen, David Robinson, John Stockton. I mean, it was unbelievable. Some of the greats. Some of the greats. And they went out and they absolutely steamrolled everybody because they literally had the best player Best players in the world at every position and on the bench. They beat their their opening game against Angola. They won by sixty eight points in that's the Olympics. Man, that's not. And it's that's not, that's not cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean they just. Where's the mercy rule in the Olympics? I mean they seriously should be. They destroyed everybody. I think they're the first team in Olympic history to score over a hundred points in every game in basketball. And they won the uh, gold medal match against Croatia by a squeaker. Only a thirty two point victory there. So, <laughs> it was just. Wow. It was ridiculous. Like, and you remember the hype around that and just how amazing it was. And I think that's what people think what makes successful teams. Yeah, it's like, for sure. get all the best players, put them in the right place, and you're going to win a championship, right? Work for the dream team. That's 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 most people's uh, mindset and thought of what a team is. Like, exactly. yeah, where, where, how do we get, how do we, just like we're playing dodgeball and like you want to handpick all, right. the, all the best guys with a cannon for your team. Yeah. And that's the only way to win. I love that you went to dodgeball because we have played dodgeball together and yeah. uh, you have a good, you have a good arm. Anyways, <laughs> now here's the problem, G. Laser. <laughs> Blazer and all kinds of lasers. Anyways, I'm going to go full white Goodman there from uh, dodgeball. But the <laughs> thing, the thing about the dream team, so, that sounds logical, right? And we're like, yeah, of course. Well, it's logical until it isn't, right? We talked about how much we loved Moneyball and how the Oakland A's found another way to win. This, if you hadn't, go back and listen to last, last episode. Week, we just uh, talked about it. We did. Now, this thought process of just get all the best players happens all the time, and it fails. This year... It fails far more often than it succeeds. Oh, yeah, exactly. So this year alone, the Bruins, and if you're a hockey fan, set the record for the most wins in a regular season. 65 out of 82 games they won this year in the NHL. Phenomenal. 
They got eliminated oh. in the first round of the playoffs. Dang it. Yeah. My Padres, which this one hurts real bad, uh, are currently fourth place in their division uh, behind <laughs> teams like the Arizona Diamondbacks, which is just ridiculous. And they have signed, I think they've signed in the past couple years, they've signed a new $300 million player. They've got like the third or fourth highest payroll in the major leagues. And Go they're, Padres. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's brutal. That one kind of hurts a lot. But why? They've got top players. Their one through nine is so intimidating. And then you get on the field and they lose all the time. And then I you, have something to do with clubhouse culture. There you go, G. Exactly. And it's the same thing. If you go back to the early 2000s, if you're a soccer fan, which of course I am, Real Madrid had a team called the Galacticos. They had the original Ronaldo. They had Figo. <laughs> the they original had, Ronaldo. That's because Cristiano Ronaldo <laughs> came afterwards. Yeah. And then they had, I mean, they had Beckham. They had Zinedine Zidane, Roberto Carlos. That's like, such a cool name. It, dude, and Zidane was legit. He was amazing. Um, you're going to just get me distracted. But the point is, <laughs> they had all these top players, never won a Champions League. Like, really didn't win even close to the amount of trophies that you would predict. And their whole philosophy, it was stated, we're going to go out and sign the best players. That was what they said to their fans. And they backed it up, except for it didn't work. And so over and over and over again, why are we telling the story? Think about the best team you've ever been on. And, and ask yourself the question, was every single person that you were with the absolute best person that there was around? Or did they know how to play a role really, really well and work well with other people? Because we want to dispel that myth that that a team just means that you have all the best players. Really, the reason we want to do that is because if you're going to be on a world-class team, the first thing is, gee, you have to believe that you can be on a world-class team, right? Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people are, will look around and be like, well, well... I see this all the time when I... So really what we're talking about t today, team, is uh, Foundations of an Unstoppable Team. Yes. It's an acronym for team. This is from a keynote that I'll go and share uh, corporately sometimes. And when I, when I work with groups, one of the most common things that you see is, you know, I'll have a leader who will come in and say, hey, like, hey, motivate my guys, mm -hmm. right? Guys aren't motivated. And it's really the case that people are just lacking motivation. Mm. That's a symptom of, of other things. But one of the things I notice on teams where people are not giving everything that they have, you have other people who have pre-diagnosed their teammates as mm. non-winners, right. right? And they're like, well, you know, we got Larry on the team, so there's no way we can win at this point. If your name's Larry, not a shot at you. <laughs> so you're thinking of uh, Parks and Rec. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> it's from yeah. Parks and Rec. I knew that. Um, but that, you know, people pre-diagnose a teammate and they think like, well, you know, all the, or, or even if they don't think that someone's not talented, it's more so like, well, we know he doesn't give his best, so we have no chance of being great, Yeah. right? And so it's a wrong mindset that you, like you've already decided, you've pre-selected, there's no way that I can be a part of a winning team. Mm. And really like team, winning teams come from, and I'm going to talk about some of this today, but winning, winning teams have a great culture and they have a culture that's based upon individuals who say, I'm going to bring my best to this program regardless mm. of what others do. And that's a bigger mindset, things that we talk about on this podcast and at Mighty Men as well. But anyways, I say that to say you have to have this prerequisite belief that you can be a part of a world-class team. And a world-class team does not mean that you have the 1992 yeah. dream team, right? But there are a lot of other ways to have a world-class team, not just by fielding the best players in the world. Yeah. Now, G, you have something that you like to call the secret sauce as well. Which Yeah, which so we're, we'll get into team here in a minute, and it's an acronym for team. Um, but there are two special ingredients. So, and really where this comes from is when I was in the SEAL teams, um, you know, I will say one of the, a great advantage I had was growing up in like a leadership culture around Pastor Keith. Shout out again, if you've not listened to the Pastor Keith episode, go back and listen to that. Such a great episode. We had to get, oh. we had to get our gong in. Yeah, for the got, episode. got to always get a gong in. If you have not listened to the episode, go back. But before I joined the SEAL teams, having grown up in a leadership culture, having grown up around a a think coach, someone who says yeah. like, why do you th th think about the, w why you think the way that you think? I went into the SEAL teams with some of this. And I remember like asking some people like, why do you think that? Or why do you think these things are this way? Like, what made you be this way? And they were just like dumbfounded by yeah. those questions. They're like, I, this is just who I am. This is just the right. way that I am. I say that to say, as I was going through the SEAL teams, I was very, um, curious. I was watching all the time. I was paying attention. And so like, the same way that I share with people, everything that you think of me as a Navy SEAL really has nothing to do with me. This is a, it's a reputation that was built before I got there, right? And I just get to uphold that. Uh, by getting to be a SEAL and getting to participate in this program, I learned so much from them. And while I was there, I was studying them. Yeah. I'm learning from them. What are the great things about the SEALs? What are the things that are special about them? And so really what's in this uh, that we're going to talk about today is what I took away from that is like, this is what makes them great. Mm. And so beyond the acronym for team, 
there's two other things uh, that I call the secret sauce. Uh, I usually add this at the end, but we're doing it at the beginning. The first thing is a trait. We actually have a whole ep- we've talked about this before is team ability. Mm. Team ability is the rapid ability to switch from leadership to followership. Most people have a natural inclination to either be a leader or a natural inc- inclination to be a follower. Right. Some people are like really good at being the number two. Some people think they should be in charge all the time. Right. Because they've got all the ideas. They have strong opinions. And you in the SEAL teams, you have a lot of guys. They're not not everyone, but you have a lot of guys who think they should be in charge all the time. But you also have this culture that teaches team ability where you realize like it's not about me. It's about the mission. Mm. And you have this mindset like if my leader steps away, something happens to my leader, whatever the case. I'm the next person in charge. I'm going to step up and take the lead. And as soon as my leader steps back, I'm going to step back into my place. It's a respect of the chain of command and understanding that chain of command is not just about like, hey, best man up. Like chain of command is a powerful tool that we use for effectiveness, right? So to dishonor chain of command is to like literally disable your effectiveness, Mm, right? So, So team ability is this rapid ability to switch from leadership to followership, knowing that I have to be able to step up or step down at any time and be willing to do both and do so quickly because it's not about me. It's about the mission. And by the way, if you're wondering what episode that's from, I quickly went to the impossible.life forward slash podcast and slapped, slapped in uh, team ability into our search and it realized that it was leadership part four where we covered team ability, which was released on February 20th of this year. <laughs> Free tool on the website. Uh, if you haven't been using that, um, if there's a topic you want to learn about, go to that page on the website and you can just search a topic and it'll tell you all the episodes that you can uh, use to listen to that. Yeah, I think I'm probably the most excited that, that we have when that we, feature. When we put the website together and I said, hey, Nick, look at this. You were so excited. Well, that's because, well, anyone that listens to this podcast knows how much. We've been out to dinner with our wives before and you said, hey, what episode is that? And I literally was like, oh, and I was like, wait a minute, we're out to dinner, dude. I don't have to answer that. And you took great joy in that. But it's like, uh, yeah, I've got like a twitch now from that. Anyways. Okay, so second part of secret. So we've got team ability. And then the second part of, and th- these are, these are attitudes, right? Team yes. ability is an attitude. Um, the other attitude that you had to have, um, this was something that was yelled at me. This is something that was also like inferred many times uh, that I learned. And that was figure it the heck out. And they used a different word, uh, but it was really this. And that could be like, man, well, how's that a part of a leadership culture? Mm. What it, that's, that's what it was in its raw form. And that's the way that that attitude feels when you haven't adopted it yet. Mm. But the SEALs have this mindset of there's no cavalry, right? Right. Like who did the Navy SEALs call when they need help? And some other special operations programs would make jokes about that. But whichever group you are, like all special operators think this way, whether it's in the Navy, whether it's the Army, whether it's the Marines, whether it's the Air Force, they all understand like no one's coming to get us, right? right? Like we're the ones who have been sent uh, on this difficult mission. So I better solve this problem. Mm. I better figure it out. Right. If you're a business owner, you've dealt with this before. Like there's stuff that you've figured out. There's stuff that you solved that nobody told you. Mm. And then you have employees who, when you say like, well, why didn't you do this? And they said, well, nobody told me. And you're very frustrated because yeah. you're like, why am I having to tell you something that nobody told me? Right. It's not necessarily an in- intelligence level thing. It's an attitude. Right. right. Because you as the business owner said, I have to, mm-hmm. I must figure this out. Right. And so seals all have this attitude of my, I must solve this problem. Yeah. I like, there's not, I can't go to somebody else. Right. I am the support. I love that. Right. So that's an attitude. You don't have to be a Navy seal to have that attitude. Correct. It's just an attitude that you can have that I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. And if you, if you're kind of going, well, you know, you guys are highly skilled and you guys have all this training. Here's the flip side. If you believe God made you, and I'm, I'm hoping you do, if you're listening to this podcast, then you have to believe that God made you to win. And that's a different thought process. If you really believe that you're made to win, it's like if you're playing a video game, right? And you, you fight this boss in a video game and he beats you. You don't just like put the controller down and go, well, I guess they didn't make this game for me to win. You get in, <laughs> you, you start the level over, don't you? You start the level over and you go, I'm going to keep going. You know they designed the game for exactly. you to beat it and you just haven't figured out what's the tactic, what's the technique to beat this exactly. boss. Exactly. So if that happens in your life and you know that you're going to win, then okay, a challenge came up. Something blew up. Something went wrong. Well, I'm made to win, so this is just the next thing that I get to figure out and solve for so I can keep going towards victory. And that sounds really easy, but I'm telling you, man, speaking from experience, I've grasped this belief, like really grasped it in my life recently. It is absolutely game-changing. Game-changer. It's it's an attitude that you must have. Indeed. 
All right, G. Well, I feel like we've talked about uh, the foundations of an unstoppable team. We need to just get into it. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So T stands for tactics. T stands for tactics. This is this is foundations of an unstoppable team. Right. Right. And so understand, this is the land. I was looking at the SEALs for, because there's uh, this isn't the things that the SEALs aren't great at. I could make that list too. It doesn't benefit anybody. Right. Right. Every culture has its downside. Every culture has its flaws. Right. And I'm not talking about like, New York Times articles that you can read about the SEALs. There's a couple of journalists over there that just like love to like, and you know, they are people who want to tear down things that are great. Um, I'm not talking about things that you would find online, but every culture has like its flaws. These are the things that made SEALs unstoppable. Mm. So this also is not like, you know, how to have a good team. This isn't how to have a healthy team. This isn't how to have like a team where everybody's friends, right? And I'm not saying that like you should do everything that the Navy SEALs do. Right. And the, and the things that I do today in the businesses that I run in the men's ministry that I get the opportunity to lead, I'm not like, how do I make this more like the Navy SEALs? Correct. Yeah. Right. But I do look at this is when it, when it comes to this element, this is how the SEALs did it. How much of this do I need to bring into this area? Mm-hmm. Right. This is the extreme form of the ingredient. How much of that ingredient do I need to bring into this recipe? Yeah. Right. So just understand that that's what this is. This is foundations of an unstoppable team. So what is a team, right? Before we get into, you know, the T in team, which is tactics, we need to talk about what is a team. A team is a group of people who perform interdependent, right? That's tac- mm-hmm. uh, things that depend on each other, in- interdependent tasks to work toward accomplishing a specific objective, right? Okay, so got it. A team is a group of people who do interdependent tasks, tasks that rely on each other to work towards a specific objective, specific being, you know, defined. We know what it is that we want to do. Um, and most people think that their business is a team. People yeah. call their businesses team or, this, you know, my, my family. But I can tell you, like, a lot of the corporations that I've had the chance to work with, they're a lot more a company than they are a team. Mm. And, and I'll explain the difference because I'll talk when I, I get the chance to work with the company. And one of my, this is one of my favorite things to do. I love, love getting the opportunity to build rapport with people, to try and understand things and really look at a, a, a business like a person and diagnose it. And when I've, when I've d- done this with a few organizations, I ask for permission to speak to everybody in the company. Mm. And so I, I'll get 20 minutes or 30 minutes. I'll sit in a conference room and I'll have everybody come in. And I'll talk to everybody, ask them questions. And what I notice is all these um, interdependent tasks, but I notice multiple objectives, mm. right? There's Everyone's got a, a very different objective. And you've also got some people within, you know, and I, I don't mean like marketing has a different objective, you know, than product delivery or engineering. I mean, like even in the marketing team, you got some people like, well, this is the main focus. And other people saying, well, this is the main mm. focus. And so you have all these divided objectives. Yeah. And that's not to say that there aren't a lot of goals and tasks within a company. But on every mission that we were on, like the first thing, the last thing we talked about is called, comm- this is in your, your mission planning. Like this is before we'd go out the door, it's called commander's intent. Mm. This is what we're here to do. Right. Right. And I see very often in businesses where that's never, that never happens. Mm. Where, where the, C- the commander, the CEO, whoever the, the main person is in a business gets up and says, this is why we're here. Yeah. This is what we're supposed to do. Everything marches towards this objective. Right. And then within that, we, and that, that mission brief sometimes is like an hour and a half long. You start with commander's intent and with commander's intent and an hour and a half in between is about how we're going to accomplish those things. What's the priority of those things? When this goes wrong, what do we do? What objectives are we willing to give up? Like all of everything is pre-decided and we're all working towards the exact same objective. But in a company, sometimes I see people who maybe they work together with their teammates, but they're not working towards a common objective. Now, you said something once that really uh, made me think, and because we talked about this, I think the reason why there isn't that understanding of true focus is because companies get distracted by trying to make money, right? And you said that a business's job is not to make money. A business's job is to solve problems. That's right. And that sounds so simple. to, To add value. Yeah. Right, but when you get focused on... And you can read a lot about this. There's a lot of really great books about this. Uh, Simon Sinek has books about this. I enjoy Vivek Ramaswamy's writings. Um, but anyways, you can, you, just for an example of how you can get focused on the wrong thing, right? Like you get focused on making bread, you should make the best bread. But mm-hmm. when you get focused on making money, you start adding enriched bleached flour into your mm-hmm. bread. And you start yeah. doing these things that are more about making money yes. than they are about creating a product. Yeah. Um, but that's a whole different conversation. So let's keep going on team. 
right? So here's what makes a team special. Um, and this is like one of the things that the SEALs were known for. And I've told stories of this. There's a lot of guys that tell stories of this, of hearing the enemy talk and they think that they're fighting against yeah. a lot more guys than they are. Love that. Right. And that's the power of sin. That's when you know you're a team, right? Because if, if you have 10 people in your company and it's the same as just 10, you know, 10 individuals working, like you're, you haven't really built anything special, right? Right. Where you build multiplication and really where you build synergy, what Aristotle says, synergy is when the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This is one plus one equals three is when you have all these people working together in such a way that 20 men become more than just 20 men. To me, I, and this is when I share this uh, keynote to people, I think it's one of, I, I, I encourage people, if you can ever be a part of a team like this, I've had the privilege of doing it once in my life. It's one of the most special, it's one of those magical things that you can do to be with a group of people that when we come together, we're more than who we were apart. It's yeah. a very special thing. Yeah, I mean, you get that opportunity whenever you get to work with me on the podcast. So you're very, you know, you're welcome <laughs> to get it twice in your life. Well done. So let's get into... Um, the, the team. So there's two factors that make up a team, right? And, and this is, we need to get into to this just to finish uh, defining what a team is. There's two factors that make up a team. The ability of individuals to work in unison, right? And I, I talked about this. This is really like some of the special part of who the team, who the SEAL teams are, how well one person can work with another person. That's one of the factors of a team. And the second factor of the team is the ability of individuals to complete their responsibilities. Yeah. That's really your skill sets, your talents, all of those things. And most people are looking at the second factor as the most important factor, right? They're like, well, you know, we've got a bunch of dudes on our team who are hitters. Right. That's great, right? Because you can go look at a bunch of other sports. There's been other Olympic basketball teams where they took like, man, these guys are the, the best shooters. They took a bunch of like number ones mm -hmm. and put them all on the team and they could not play together, right? Where individually they were really great, but they couldn't play together. So what will multiply a team, what will make a team great is that team's ability to work in unison. So yeah. just understand that about a team. A team, like the, the, the value or the synergy factor, if I wanted to call it that synergy factor of a team, is individual abilities multiplied by individual abilities to work in unison. Mm, yeah, I like that, man. So let's get into team. The T in team is tactics. Tactics is not just a battlefield word, right? You have a tactic for how you do everything. You have a tactic for how you get in your car. You have a tactic for how you drive to work. Like that's a ta everything is a tactic, right? Mm. Tactics are an arrangement of actions with the design to win or complete an, ob an objective, right? So you, you, everything you do, you're doing it like, well, I want to make this happen. And I have, you know, an idea of how to do these specific actions to make this objective occur. Understand that there's a difference between tactics and strategy. Strategy is knowing what to do. Tactics is knowing how to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I say this seals like the T and team is tactics because seals are very focused on the how, right? right? Like it's our, how well we can work together. Right. The objective is, hey, we're going to go capture this guy. The objective is we're going to take that hill. But SEALs are known for their tactics of we're going to break this complex problem down of mm. uh, surrounding this compound, taking this person alive, climbing this hill, whatever it is. We're going to take down this complex problem and break it into a bunch of really simple problems. Tactics is knowing how to do it. And you would think strategy is very important, and it is. I'm a strategy guy. I would tell you it's one of my like top strengths. Uh, according to Strengths Finder, it is my number one strength, right? Like I personally put a lot of value on strength, uh, on strategy. But Patton said this. General Patton said, "Good tactics can save the worst strategy. Bad tactics will destroy the best strategy." Mm. Now Patton was a general who was known for incredible strategy, and Patton was a general who was so loved by the men because they said, oh man, Patton's leading this battle. Right. We're going to win Yeah, because he always knew what to do, right? It's, if you are a leader, you are a great leader when people look at you and say like, man, he always knows what to do. Yeah, for like real. that gives people trust in you. It'll make your men want to work hard, right? The men loved working for Patton. They're like, man, Patton's leading this battle. We will have a great plan because there are other generals who had bad plans, mm -hmm. right? Who did not, who didn't have the strategy that he had. And so even a man who is known for his great strategy, he said, good tactics can save the worst strategy, bad tactics will destroy the best strategy. So even if you have this really great strategy, you got the best strategy, if you can't execute on it, mm. if you don't have tactics, if you don't know how to do it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And vice versa, you might have a marginal strategy, 
but if you can execute it on it very well, you will be very successful. And so every, in everything that you do, you need to be able to break down your tactics to like the very simple level, right? So we spent hours, mm. hours, hours training just how to walk. I'm, I'm not joking, how to walk through a door. Really? Yes. Oh, for CQC? Yeah, for, for close quarters clearance, right? For how to walk through a door. Because that's where a, lot, it's where a lot of people get shot is in the door. It's called the fatal funnel, right? right? So we would spend a lot of time literally like, I mean, like high level martial arts of like move your feet this way as you come through the door. Right. Right. That's how dialed in we were about our tactics. And that's also what gives SEALs the ability for a few men to walk into a building where they know they're coming. Where these guys are armed with machine guns, walk in there, shoot the bad guys, don't shoot any innocent people. Right. And people knew you were coming and you couldn't be stopped. Yeah. Right. That's the power of tactics. Mm, that's execution. You said you said execution. And I think it really dawned on me. I'm glad you used that word because I remember when we were before we were doing what we we're doing before we became good friends. I was sat next to you in a mastermind and you talked to somebody was talking about, they had this idea and you looked at me and you said, ideas are great, but you know, they're a dime a dozen. What really counts is execution. And I'd heard that once before from a friend who's a very successful businessman, multimillionaire, bought and sold companies. And he said the exact same thing to me. And what do we, you said, strategy is knowing what to do. Tactics is how to do it. Yeah. Everybody on the internet's like, here's how you're going to get big biceps. Here's how, like, so we focus all the time or no, on the what we focus on the what, but no one says like, Hey, when you do three sets of 10 on your curls, you can't just go in there and start, you know, doing it this way. Here's exactly how to execute a perfect curl. So you have these people going, oh, it didn't work. Well, no, you executed horribly, but you won't, you aren't even aware about it because all you're looking for is what do I do? It, so I really want to highlight that. I think that's such a good point. Very, very good. There's three things that if, if you're taking notes, which, I, and I know a lot of you are, if you're taking notes, this is what you should write down about tactics, right? Because what I want you to do, I, I, we don't have time to go like full on into a long exercise about this, but I want you, what I want you to do after this, and I'll give a, maybe a few small challenges just throughout the episode here. What I want you to do is think about your tactics for whatever your trade is, mm. right? You also have tactics as a mom or a dad. You have tactics as a husband or a wife, but in, in your business, think about some of your tactics, the things that you do. Mm. Here's what a tactic should do. Tactics enhance overall success. Mm. Tactics add control and reduce or manage risk, mm. right? We have tactics for how we like sp very specific tactics, how we jump out of airplanes, how we manage emergency procedures. My wife was asking me, you know, in light of this like submarine thing that happened last mm. week, my wife was asking me like, yeah, would you ever do something like that? And I said, yeah, I, w I would. But, you know, one of the I I'd be I would be willing to go down to the Titanic um, in a submarine, but I would, I would, what I also have is the ability, obviously like, you know, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. everyone's looking back at this sub and be like, man, these guys were pretty unsafe, mm -hmm. right? One of the great things I learned in the military was how to do very dangerous things in a safe way. Um, I remember like you, you can't jump out of the plane, uh, with ground winds over 15 miles an hour, right? And it's like, why can't we do that? Why can't we jump out when it's 16? Like we, we need to make, you know, just one extra yeah. mile per hour. And I remember this is when I'm a new jumper. This is before I, I went to JM school. But anyways, I remember. That's jump master for those of you non-military people. I remember being in like a, a, a jump training workup. We were jumping like, you know, 10 times a day, multiple, you know, multiple days. And we, um, anyways, long story short, we got on this jump and the winds are like right at 15 and they get us out of the plane. Well, by the time we got on the ground, it was like 18 mile per hour winds. And a bunch of dudes got busted up oh, wow. really, really bad, right? These are elite athletes. We've been two weeks into this like training workup. Uh, nobody like was, you know, like fatally injured or anything, but uh, you know, essentially everyone landed going backwards, like seven to eight miles an hour. Oh, wow. Right. And that's if you're perfectly p pitched into the wind, if you're even off at an angle or anything, just by a few degrees, you might be going 10, 12 miles per hour backwards. Right. And so guys just got busted up. You, you're because the wind is faster than your forward speed of your parachute. Right. So you're landing on the ground looking forward, but you're moving backwards. Huh. Right. And guys also, everyone, when we did this jump, everyone had equipment. Right. right. So that just adds to it. Yeah. Right. Like sometimes you jump with no equipment. We were jumping with equipment that day. Added drag, added stuff to hurt you. So anyways, if they had to say that day was like a takeaway for me. It's like, this is why the military has a line. Right. Right. Because, okay, well, what if, you know, we had jumped out when it was 16, it had been even worse. The military taught me like the military has very defined tactics. Here's, we know what the line looks like. We know how close we can get to the line. And then we do not deviate. We have our own level of control tactics, add control and reduce or manage risk. I could talk about that for a long time. And tactics create repeatability, which increases speed, hmm. right? If you just look at like some of the things that you do things, Right. If you watched me get in my truck, 
Like I get in my truck and do the exact same thing every time. I have the exact same sequence to start my car, set my keys away, close the garage, take, you know, release the parking brake and head out of the driveway, right? Like everything you do has a tactic. And when you've defined your tactics, you will get faster over time, mm. right? And so SEALs, like when you watch them do close quarters clearance, and that's really like where SEALs are the most known is for their tactics. Uh, most of, uh, most of like the... Uh, professional forces in America learn their tactics from the SEAL teams, SWAT teams, police forces, all this stuff gets diluted down from SEAL close quarters clearance tactics. And there's other special operation groups that are like, they own other areas. I would tell you that the SEALs own close quarter uh, clearance, especially uh, specifically development group. And those tactics get, get passed down. You watch them do things and you have, you have a, a few SEALs who can clear, you know, say a specific building without speaking clear it in four minutes where a police force like it would take these guys 35 minutes to an hour to clear mm. this target wow and then make a bunch of noise they're yelling at each other trying to figure it out and hopefully don't have any like safety errors yeah where you know 15 or 20 seals can clear that building in four minutes that's crazy right and it's it's not about intelligence level it's about tactics and training on those tactics so if you want to be unstoppable, you need to know what your tactics are. You need to know how to get better at them, right? Like if you work in sales, you know there are sales tactics yes, that work. Sure. There are sales tactics that don't work. And you're just, if you're just out there shooting from the hip all the time, you, sometimes you'll hit with a bad tactic and sometimes you won't, but you cannot have repeated success. Yeah. No, when good. you have clearly defined tactics, you know why you win every time. I love that, man. We spent a lot of time on tactics, G, so I feel like we should move on to the E in teams if you're ready yeah, to Yeah, so, do so E is equanimity. We actually have a whole episode about this one. We do, and uh, I will quickly type it into our handy-dandy finder here to see when we released it. And think about how fast that was. I found it just that fast. <laughs> November 14th, that's when we launched it. So we have a whole episode on equanimity, so I won't spend a ton of time on equi equanimity, but the E in uh, team is equanimity. Let me, let me just, to recap, give the definition on equanimity. Equanimity is the evenness of mind, that calm temper or firmness of mind, which is not easily elated or depressed, which sustains prosperity without excessive joy and adversity without violent agitation of the passions or depression of spirits. The great man bears misfortune without equanimity. Right? It also means even mind or even soul. Epictetus said people are not disturbed by things, but by the view they take of them. Equanimity is this internal power that you have to not, not be a thermometer for your situation, yes. but to be a thermostat. To say in any situation, this is the way that I need to be. I'm going to control my mind. I'm going to control my thoughts. I'm going to control my emotions, right? Because this maybe this situation is really frustrating to me and it's getting me amped up, but it's not going to help me in this situation. Or maybe like I just did something really awesome. Maybe I just had a great win on the battlefield. Maybe I just had a great win in business. Maybe things are going really well in this area of my life. And I get so excited and over elated by that, that I become distracted and other areas. Equanimity is this incredibly powerful mindset that you can have to bring the best of who you are into any situation, not so that you can feel your best, so that you can bring your best. To me, equanimity is comes from comes from this mindset. The Stoics developed this, and the Stoics were focused on something that wasn't them as well. Equanimity comes from this mindset of serving the mission. Mm. Right. If you want to be someone that has self-control and especially emotional control, and let me speak to any of you that have anger problems or just have emotional control problems. When you are most out of control, your life is mostly about you, mm. right? Like it, to be emotionally out of control is a very selfish thing. It's about the way that you feel, right? And I don't, I don't want to be someone who doesn't feel emotions, right? Because emotions allow you to speak to people. Emotions allow you to feel what somebody else feels. Emotions is a part of life. But my emotions do not lead me right? My emotions are just an indicator for me, but they are not a guide. The reason I, I have equanimity and the, the reason I desire to have equanimity is because I want, like one of my I, I wants and one of my I ams for my life is I want to be useful, mm. right? Like not, not I want to feel good feelings, right? right? That's, not, that's not an I want for my life. I want to be useful. I want to be able to serve a cause. And if, I, if I'm going to be useful in my life, I need to be able to set the thermostat on this is who I am in this situation. So no matter what's going on around me, I'm going to be the one that says this is who I need to be in this situation. Yeah. Now, for a lot of people out there, you will not necessarily be like, okay, dude, equanimity, that's your thing, Garrett. We get it. But if you've not seen great equanimity displayed, you don't realize what a superpower it is. I'm around you a lot. I'm around your dad a fair amount. You guys are both 
people who display equanimity on a regular basis. And I can tell you that the power of seeing somebody who stays calm when things are, no matter what's happening and chooses their response, it's different, man. So here, let me give people a reference experience. Here's where a lot of people have seen it. If you've ever seen an EMT or somebody who's a professional, like a firefighter or an ambulance person come onto the scene when somebody has been severely hurt, you'll notice that they're not like, oh my gosh, sir, sir, oh my, oh, what do we do? What do they say? They come up like, how they ask you a question like, how long has he been like this? Or, hey, um, so what happened? And it's really calm and collected. And that's actually what they train you if you ever do yeah, first day of training. they know like, I'm here to help. Yes. And my emotions will not help you. Yes, because if so they show what, freaked out. Yeah. How can I serve you? Yes. Right? So equanimity is a tool to help you be more capable, to help you be more successful, to accomplish your mission, right? And it's taking the, the part of you that is most you, right? It's taking you out yeah. of it. I'm going to take myself out of the equation mm. and I want to just bring the best that I can bring to serve these people, to serve my mission. Love that, man. Uh, I've said it this way, uh, no pity parties and no touchdown dances, right? And I, I've got some stories that I could go into about those that are both long, so I won't tell them, but I'll just say like there's a high and a low to equanimity, right? In the SEAL teams, equanimity is mostly like, do you panic when you're getting shot at, which right. is very important that you don't, right? Yeah. You won't be very good at your job. Um, but equanimity isn't just about like managing the high stress, right? Or managing the, the fear, managing the anger. There's also the over elation, right? Mm -hmm. To where like you're getting too excited for a situation. Most people don't think about how that could distract them, right? Like in, in football, you know, guys score a goal and then, you know, they score a touchdown and then they're just like running, you know, the clock stops and they're just running around goofing off, jumping right. the Salvation Army thing, get a fine for charity. Like, Shout oh, cool. Um, but the clock does not stop in life, right? Right, And so you have to be able to take these, you know, take a quick pause, catch the moment and then move forward because otherwise like your overexcitement will be just as distracting to you as your fear, as your frustration, as your anger and resentment. And just to sum this up, that equanimity is not just a battlefield thing. If you know who Warren Buffett is, most people do. Um, you may or may not have heard of, you know, his silent partner. He's not silent, but he's like a silent <laughs> partner because most people don't know who he is. That's like me on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is kind of like that. Okay. He, has, he plays just as much of a part. You just don't see him as much. Good recovery. Um, is Charlie Munger. Right. If you want to listen, you can you can hear and listen to Charlie Munger, but really you can't like buy his books on Amazon. You have to go find some of his right. writings where they do these annual reviews. They do these annual speakings to the companies in their portfolio. But anyways, this is something that Charlie Munger said, one of the most successful investors uh, of all time. Right. Because he hasn't just been successful over five years or 10 years, been successful over 50 years, repeated pattern of success. This guy has identified things that continually work. This is what Charlie Munger says. A lot, of people with, a lot of people with high IQs are terrible investors. And let me just pause right there to say, right, this is, this is breaking down some of the misconception of a great individual that you think makes up a great team, right? It's not about high IQs. It's not about high right. talent. And you may say, well, I'm not an investor. Yes, you are. Every single yeah. person listening to this podcast is an investor. Whether you put your money in any sort of investments or not doesn't make you an investor or not. You, everyone, everyone on earth gets time given to them, yeah, okay. right? And that time is a resource. All investors are is are people who put resources in a specific area to make them grow. I can turn this resource into more. You decide what you want to do with your life, with your time, with your money, with whatever resources you have, and you can put them in places that grow or you can put them in places where they shrink and they dwindle and they die, right? So we're all investors. And Charlie says, a lot of people with high IQs are terrible investors because they've got terrible temperaments. And that is why we say that having a certain kind of temperament is more important than brains. Mm. You need to keep raw, irrational emotion under control. You need patience and discipline and an ability to take losses and adversity without growing crazy. You need an ability to not be driven crazy by extreme success. Mm. Yeah. Right. So this is Charlie Munger, one of the most successful investors of all time. He says, you're not, good invest you're not a good investor because you're smart. You're a good investor. You're a good investor because you can control your temperament, mm. because you have self-control over your emotions to say, okay, I, I, I'm feeling excited right now, but is that what this situation needs? Mm. I'm feeling, feeling very upset. I'm feeling like I'm a failure right now. I'm feeling like the situation is eroding away from me and I'm out of control. Is that how I need to feel right now? Or what does the mission need from me? Right. Good. Good, G. You ready to uh, go to A? 
Let's go to the A in team, right? So we have tactics, which is knowing how to do things. We have equanimity, which is self-control, evenness of mind. And the A in team is all in, right? All in is not um, like I wake up at four in the morning every day and chug three rock stars. And then <laughs> like I grind on my, you know, phone call list for 14 hours straight. And then I go to my second job. Yeah. Right. Like that's what, that is the internet's version of like all in, like, right. are you grinding 20 hours a day, you know, f- or, or, you know, and I won't go into that. Like, but that's not what all in is about, right? All in is not like, well, I just push all my chips in. Right. Right. That's not what all in is about. I live every day like it's my last. (laughs) (laughs) Patrick Lencioni, if you don't know who he is, great author. Um, He's actually in this in this part of the the story that I'm going to quote him from. This is from a conversation with a billionaire uh, that he was having that who had has a track record of success. And he's telling um, this 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 part in, in the book. It's from this story with another person. But anyways, from his book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. If you've never read it before, I highly suggest you read it. If you work on on any level of teams, or especially if you're a leader of teams or a business owner, uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. This is what it says. And I I wholeheartedly believe this 100%. I'm on board with this. If you could get all the people in an organization rowing in the same direction, you could dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. Mm. Right. And so you've got a lot of people. Let, let's just let's just flip the other side. Of right. That. You got a lot of people say like, well, you'll win if it's the, the right time. You'll win if you get all the right people. You'll win uh, only when, you know, the market's working for mm-hmm. you. You'll win when you have the right product placement. You know, you'll win when you get your pricing strategy correct. Blah, 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 blah. You can come up with all these situations for why, you know, only some people win. Or let me read this again. If you could get all the people in an organization rowing in the same direction, you could dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. When the first time I read that, I was like, that's, I, I've believed that since I was a child. Hmm. And now like it's been proven to me, right? Like so many times throughout my life, Nick, I've been put on the team that wasn't the team of all the all-stars, right? Right. I watched those teams get picked and I knew I was supposed to win. Hmm. Right. I watched those teams get picked and I wasn't on the team, but I knew I was supposed to win. And I'm looking at the team that I have and I say, oh, I guess we don't I guess being the most talented isn't the only way to win Mm because I know I'm supposed to win. So we're just going to have to work together better than those uh, than those people. Right. And so this is a truth in life. This is a truth of truth about the principle of teamwork, that if you can get everyone working together, you can dominate in any industry against any market in any competition at any time. You have to believe that's true about the team that you're on. And you have to say like, man, if my team isn't winning, it's because we're not all rowing together. Mm. The first team that I was on at SEAL Team 3, we struggled from this. And I'll keep this story short, but we struggled from this. I had a leader who was really not the best leader. Um, he was not the most talented. He's not the most skilled. Like the things that he was really good at were not the things that were like the most important things for being a, a leader of a SEAL team. Um, and we had been given this really great deployment opportunity and long story short, um, this was a deployment that so many people had wanted to do, uh, but we had a leader that wasn't a great leader, and we were just failing all through our workup uh, coming into this deployment. Like, just thing after thing, we were doing very poorly on, and all of us on the team are like, yeah, we, we suck because our leader sucks, right? And that's true. Everything rises and falls on leadership. But also remember what General Patton said, Yeah. right? Bad tactics can save the, the worst strat I mean, can destroy the best strategy, but good tactics can save the worst strategy. And so we, we kind of went, this was like one of the most painful and frustrating seasons in my life where I learned one of the greatest lessons where I'm on a team where the leader's not great and where there's just so much infighting and frustration on the team. And we're getting closer and closer to deployment. And we have this moment kind of like a uh, in-house meeting without our, out our leader. And, I, and it was not a healthy meeting. It was more of like a very toxic meeting, a very frustrated, very angry meeting. But we all kind of came to this conclusion that our leader's not going away mm. and we're going to have to figure it out. And the adi- after that meeting, the attitude of the team really shifted from everyone saying, like, I wish we could throw the captain off of the ship 
to me looking at one of my best friends and saying, if you don't row as hard as you can for the captain who neither of us like, I'll throw you off the ship. Mm. Right. And uh, the way that we performed as a team really shifted from that point because everyone decided to row for the captain. It's not about like, well, we think the captain sucks and he did. Right. But I'm not, we're not here for the captain's accolades. We're here because we want to win. We're here because we want to row this ship across the ocean and it's so much bigger than Mm -hmm. us and it's so much more important than us. So I'm going to give all that I have. And if you're on a team where you feel like other people aren't rowing, you know what? Maybe they're looking at you thinking the same thing you're thinking about them. Man, Nick doesn't row very hard, so I'm not going to row either. Mm -hmm. And Nick's looking at me saying, man, Garrett doesn't row very hard, so I'm not going to row either. You know what can be the spark to change your team? If they say, man, why is that guy like row so hard? Yeah. Why see maybe okay I'll I'll row a little bit harder but you can't control other people's actions. All in is this mindset of you saying like I know if I give everything that I have maybe I can inspire other people to give more. And this team could never be what it's supposed to be if I'm not giving everything that I have. So that's what I can control and that's what I'm going to do. I love that. So in case you didn't miss that or in case you missed it, I hope you just captured that Garrett might have obliterated your thought that Navy Seals is just all guys who are 100s out of 100. Because I, I found that fascinating the first time you told me that story to be like, wait, so you're telling me that you guys would look at some guys and be like, oh, he's not a great SEAL or he's not a great leader. I, I was surprised by tr- that. I mean, you go into any professional sports yeah, organization yeah. and there's going to be guys who are like, man, that guy sucks. Why is he here? Right. Right. And that guy who like the, the guys on the pro team are saying he sucks. Why is he here? That guy had been a winner his whole life. Yes. Right. That guy was one of the best on his college team. That guy was great yeah. in high school. But then you, you, you get to a level and it's like, and you're the worst guy in the room. Mm. Right. The, the point is, in every organization, there are, you know, you have the most talented people, you have the least talented people, but it's it's about their ability to come together. It's yeah. the, the factor of uh, interdependent people to work together in unison that make a team very, very special. Yeah, I like that, G. All right, are you ready to move on to So M? the last, so we have tactics, we have equanimity, we have A is all in, and the M in team, this is my favorite, is mastery of basics, right? Mastery of basics. And Jim Rohn says this, success is neither magical nor mysterious. Success is the natural consequence of consistently applying the basic fundamentals. Let me read that again. Success is neither magical nor mysterious, right? To some people it is. Success is like, man, like it's this mystical thing. I don't know how, like I've done it once. I don't know how to do it again. I don't know how those people do that. Success is the natural consequence of consistently applying the basic fundamentals. You know, I see all these things of, I've seen funny videos on the internet and I talk to people and I get these like, I I hear people's ideas of like SEAL tactics. Yes. And they think it's all these like really complex things. There's these funny videos. It's not funny right now because of like what's going on in the world with Russia. But there's these funny, funny videos of Spetsnaz training. Like Spetsnaz is the, the Russian special forces. Oh, or like, right. Like the Russian Navy SEALs are the okay. Spetsnaz. And there's this video of them training, you know, obviously Russia is like big on propaganda. Right. And there's these propaganda videos of Spetsnaz doing like running off of this um, platform, doing a running gain or a backflip and throwing a tomahawk. Right. And like hitting the target. Right. Yeah. And it, they all just like do it in a row. It's, it's a really cool video, but it's like this is like ridiculous training. And you're really, saying you never did a backflip and threw a tomahawk as a Navy uh, SEAL? Not in SEAL training. Well, I don't, I'm not going to say that I've never done that. Oh, right. <laughs> not in SEAL I didn't training. expect that. Okay. <laughs> But like a lot of people think like, yeah, that's how you train to be, especially that's, that's how you train for the seals. Yeah. Right. And that's like, even when I do like firearms training with people very quickly, they want to get to the running and gunning. Yeah. Right. Like how, how do I do like the knee slide into the, the combat shot? Right. Like how do I do all of the advanced things? That's what people think that tactics are, right? I mean, that's what people think the um, like what makes a, a team great. But the SEALs understand mastery of basics. Right. One of my best friends in the SEAL teams, a great leader in my life, he said that all complex problems are just a bunch of simple problems put together, right? And you're when you're very good at the basics, simple problems are, you know, just butter in the pan to you. Yeah. Like they just erode, right? And so when you're really good at simple problems in that way, you're also very good at complex problems, mm. right? It's like, I, this problem is, a, is, you know, problem A, B, and C. And I've solved problem A a million times. I've solved problem, problem B a half a million times, right? So you look at problem A, B, and C together, you're like, this is just breakfast for me, right? This is not difficult. So mastery of basics is looking at the things that you do, like what are the basic skills for my job? What are the basic skills for my career? And not like, how do I make the 500-yard shot? 
how do I like chuck a grenade into the courtyard, right. you know, 50 yards away, like all of those things, right? No, for the seals, this was, you, you would think that we're doing, you know, the running off the platform backflip, throwing an ax at things. Most of seal training is like we would do a two week shooting course and half of that shooting course is like basic static line shooting, practicing trigger control, mm. which is the hardest part of, of pistol marksmanship, which also bleeds into rifle marksmanship is uh, trigger control, right? So we would do this drill where we would shoot a piece of paper, which is like the most non-fun firearms training. Right? It's really fun in firearms is shooting steel, right? right? But when you're shooting a 12 inch steel plate, hitting the center and hitting the outside of the plate gives you the same effect. You get that, that, that hit of like, oh, I hit steel and you're like, now I'm awesome. Right. right? But you really don't see what you're at, how, how good your accuracy actually is. We spent a lot of time at the three yard line shooting a piece of paper with our pistol and trying to put a hundred bullets to the same hole where I've shot a hundred rounds and it looks like I've shot one. Wow. Right. Like that's, I mean, like, I mean, think like Robin hood, like trying to yeah. split the arrow, like what is mastery of my skill set look like hmm. when you can do that, when you at three and you think like three yards, like that's not a big deal. Most people can't like at the three yard line can't like keep their bullets in a hole the size of a cookie, yeah, let alone true. through the same bullet hole, yeah. right? You just think like, oh yeah, three yards isn't that big of a deal. It's actually a lot harder than you think. But when you can do that, when you can put the same bullet through the same hole for a hundred rounds with a pistol at three yards, right? Like you can one hand dive and shoot at 15 yards. I'm not saying we ever do that kind of thing, but I'm saying when you have like, but you don't do that stuff in training, but if you ever get thrown into that situation in the real world, you have done the basic thing millions of times, yeah. right? When you've shot millions of three pointers at the static or, or from the top of the, the circle, when you've shot millions of free throws, when you start moving around, it's really not that hard. Right. But if you spend all your try, time trying to like pull up fadeaway shots, right? You never actually develop a skill set. Yeah. I love a great quote from my friend, Garrett Uncle Buck. <laughs> and you said the difference between pros and amateurs is how quickly they recover from malfunction. Right. I thought that was a great way of saying it because you talk about this on the range. If something goes wrong, a pro will tap rack and be done. Oh, An man. amateur will stop and look at the gun like, what, what's when going I, on? People want me to shoot with them and I go train with them and they want me to see how good they are. Right. Right. Like, and, But I don't measure someone's good by how good they are when things are going right. Right. I measure someone like really how skilled are you? Like how much of an expert are you when your gun jams? How do you deal with it? Right. Right. Like we were never allowed to like when you are on the range and you're on the firing line, you, we, you call it in the fight. Right. Right. Like if your gun jams, it's not like, Oh, well I'll just start this drill over. Right. No, every time you treat it as if it's the real thing. Right. And so you stand there and work it. And when you're, when you're doing drills in the seal teams, you go like one at a time and everyone's watching you. Right. So like there's always pressure in the situation, but I like get on the range with people who are mostly civilians or even sometimes police officers or from other areas and like they'll get a jam and like you see them come out of the zone and they're right. like, oh, okay, well, let me just fix this casually and then I'll try the drill again. No, that's like some of the best training that you mm. actually get to fix your problem under pressure. Mm. Um, so I say that to say, and, and like that quote, really is the measure of professional because you've practiced and prepared these things over and over that when you get hit in the face, you actually know what to do. Yeah. Now where that uh, goes for people whose job isn't carrying a handgun around, uh, you, we talked about this beforehand and you talked about how well do you know your programs? Like if you're using email, if you, you know what? Excel, yeah. Yeah. Like, Most people, if you work in a professional office environment, you have to use email, right? Uh, my executive assistant was, I was showing him some of the things that I do on email. Right. Like I have, I have, you know, seven different email addresses and, you know, hundreds of emails coming in all the time. I have to be very, or, and I'm not perfect, but I have to be very organized with that stuff. So I have rules. I have folders for how all these things work. I, I mark them to certain categories so that I follow up so that I, you know, I also send a lot of emails. And so I have things that help me remember that I sent an email and they haven't replied back. So I have something to help mm -hmm. me go and follow up. I'm not just like, you know, firing from the hip and hoping I remember where all this stuff is. Um, so that's like something that I can just, you can be better at that. A lot of people have to use Excel, right? Like, I think it's funny when people have to use Excel, like five to seven hours a week in their job. And they know like three basic commands and three right. basic formulas. Like, why aren't you better at some of the things that you do? Mm. Don't train to the lowest common denominator. What's, what, how, what amount of skill do I have to have to be able to get my job done? 
more so look at the things that you have and like, how can I be an expert at this mm. thing? Like you want to move up in your job because you see yourself as better than you are. Be the best at the basic skills that you already know. Get better at the tasks that you already have to where like, I mean, but this is some conversation that me and, and my assistant have had. He's young, so he's learning some things, but this is just an example of mastery of basics. Like I give him things to do uh, that is work that I have. And he, like, he's seen me do some of these things in like 15 or 20 minutes and I'll give him the task and it might take him an hour or two. Right. And I need him to, I need him to, you know, spend an hour or two on it so I can get some of my time back. But it's also a lesson for him. than some of the conversation we've had that look like, see what's possible for you, that yes. you can get better at these things, right. To where you can multiply your value, multiply your time, multiply your abilities by being able to do something that used to take you an hour. And now you can do it in 10 minutes so yeah. by just being better at your job. Yeah. I love that, man. So I hope everybody's I, I, mean, I think there's a lot of takeaways. We're not telling you how to build an unstoppable team. What we're doing is we're looking at one that is an unstoppable team in the Navy SEALs, and we're saying, look, these are the foundations of what makes them special. And I think that I think there's so many great takeaways from tactics, equanimity, all in, mastery of basics. Like, I don't know about when I'm listening to this, I'm going, man. Nobody came to the ooh. SEAL teams. No one came. I, there's no one who came in who was an expert at the things right. that you do as a SEAL before they got there. Right. Right. Like they screened for a few specific qualities, like that you're very tough, that you're very resilient, that you don't give up mm -hmm. and you have a base level of intelligence. And it was not a high base. <laughs> right. I'm, I don't say that to me to be derogatory. Yeah. It was not a high base because they said, if you, if you just have this level of intelligence, we can make you do things that like most humans can never do. Mm. And you don't have to be that smart. You just have to go through this. If you have these qualities and a base level of, base level of intelligence plus the way that we train, you can be one of the greatest in the world. That's right. Amazing. And so that's the, that's what I want people to understand yeah. with themselves is like, you don't, you don't have to be Michael Jordan. Right. You don't. And, and that dude worked really, really hard, but you yep. don't have to be whoever this person is that you think has like more talent and ability than you. You don't have to be that person to be world-class. Yeah. I love that G. Well, we should probably wrap now G. Uh, what's the, uh, we went a little bit longer, but we got Garrett on a subject he's very passionate about talking about I, I enjoy all of this stuff and it's it's really like my some of my life passion to help people um so much of my life i would i just wish people knew what i knew i wish mm -hmm. people knew what i knew about seal teams i wish people knew what i knew about following god i wish people knew yeah. what i knew about so many things in life so i am excited to share that with people um so really my challenge uh on this episode is think about like the team that you're on think about the areas that you serve and seek to seek within yourself have i had any misconceptions about my team have i already pre-decided that my team's not going to be the greatest or have i already pre-decided that i don't think my team could be world class i hope within each and every single one of you listening to this podcast that you will have a desire to one day be a part of a world-class team yes. and maybe the team you're on today is not that world-class team maybe it's not but be a world-class team player and maybe you'll find your way onto a world-class team one day